the man, the myth, the mouse. Disney may be the name of an empire now, but once upon a time, it was just the name of a man who wanted to deliver happiness whether through cheerful characters, magical movies, or unprecedented parks. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're chronicling the true story of Walt Disney and tracing the origins of his ferocious work ethic and childhood-defining brilliance. It was clear from a very young age that Walter Elias Disney had a creative flair, particularly for drawing. Born in Chicago in 1901, Walt spent his childhood honing his art skills by replicating newspaper cartoons, coloring, and even experimenting with watercolors. To his credit, when Dad wanted to take art lessons, wanted to be an artist, Elias arranged for him to have some art lessons, made it possible for him. He'd even eventually become a cartoonist for his high school newspaper. But success in his other studies didn't come as easily. Fatigued following his early morning and evening newspaper routes, Walt would regularly doze off in his classes. Always searching for new experiences, Walt even tried forging his way into the army, but ultimately ended up spreading joy to soldiers with patriotic sketches on the side of Red Cross ambulances. Walt painted his truck and sent drawings home to magazines. They were all rejected. In fact, some of Walt's sketches actually ended up being showcased in an army newspaper. When Walt was passionate about something, his drive and work ethic were clear, something he maintained for the rest of his life. As Walt kept trying to break into animation, he hit roadblock after roadblock, but did meet someone important along the way, Ub Iwerks. After a few failed animation ventures as a mentee artist and starting their own company, Walt and Iwerks eventually ended up doing cut-out commercial animations for the Kansas City Film Ad Company. I used, uh all sort of little puppet things. We didn't draw them like we do today. I used to make little cutout things and joints were pinned and we'd put them under the camera and we'd maneuver them and make them do things. As always, Walt was looking to put his own unique stamp on his work, so he tinkered with the method of cell animation in his spare time and ultimately developed his own company to create laughogram cartoons for a local theater. Lo and behold, Laughogram Studio was born, but didn't last long. In 1923, the Laughogram studio went bust and Walt left Missouri for Hollywood. But he wasn't going there empty-handed. He, along with Ub Iwerks and others, had been working on a 12 and a half minute film called Alice's Wonderland, which he later sold as an episodic series. <laughs> This effectively led to the creation of the Disney Brothers studio the same year, which he formed with his brother Roy. After a few years, Walt wanted to switch things up from the Alice series and set his sights on his next creation and character, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. But ultimately, he'd have this new character snatched out from under him, along with most of his animation staff, except of Iwerks. Though the Disneys were left without a character to spearhead their studio, losing the Lucky Rabbit did seem lucky indeed. After putting their heads together, Disney and Iwerks created a new mascot, a little guy by the name of Mortimer Mouse, later renamed Mickey Mouse, Walt's wife Lillian's suggestion. The two worked on the sketch together, Walt added the voice, and boom, a legend was born. Yeah, <laughs> it's me, I guess. <laughs> Mickey's first big outing, after test shorts like Playing Crazy, was Steamboat Willie, a short that used revolutionary synchronized sound. <laughs> This style would give future Disney shorts like the Silly Symphony series a real edge. In a push to reduce production costs, Walt brought in a new initiative for lower paid animators to come in to produce the sketches in between key poses of characters, which were done by the core team. At the same time, Walt was trying to bring more money in by asking Celebrity Pictures executive Pat Powers, who he was working with at the time, for a pay raise for the cartoons they were producing. Powers refused, and to add insult to injury, signed up iWorks to work for him. Driven to his limit, Walt had a nervous breakdown in 1931 and took a break abroad with his wife to recuperate. I got to a point that I couldn't talk on the telephone. I'd begin to uh, cry, and uh, the least little thing, I'd uh, just go that way. And it seems some time away from the studio was just what Walt needed. When he returned, Disney Studios signed a contract with Columbia Pictures, who would distribute Mickey Mouse cartoons and newfangled Technicolor shorts of Flowers and Trees and The Three Little Pigs, both of which won Academy Awards. But as always, Walt was looking for the next best thing, and he believed that to be full-length feature movies. 
Well, what was deemed Disney's folly turned out to be a little picture named Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, premiering in 1937 to universal praise. I said, how do you do? How do you do what? Oh, you can talk! I'm so glad! Walt had left no stone unturned to make this the most impressive film, using live-action reference for his animators and developing the new multiplane camera. However, regardless of Snow White's success, Disney's next movies Pinocchio and Fantasia, both released in 1940, did not perform well at the box office. Also ambitious undertakings, the loss of international audiences during the start of World War II proved an all but impossible hurdle to overcome. This slump left the studio in a lot of debt, causing Disney Studios to make huge cuts to wages. Ultimately, this resulted in tension amongst employees and the 1941 animator strike. There's before the strike and there's after. And it was two different people. With that, Disney's next movie, Dumbo, was interrupted at several different stages, looking like the elephant might never fly. It wasn't just wage disputes that rubbed Disney employees the wrong way, however. Walt was famous for his unrelenting demands in the studio, very rarely giving any praise to his staff. That'll work would be considered a huge gesture of encouragement. If you could get that'll work from Walt Disney, you knew you had done your job. That was a good day. That was a good meeting. He would also famously cough loudly before entering rooms to warn workers that they should be on their toes and ready for his arrival. We'd hear Walt coughing coming down the hall. One of the guys would say, man is in the forest, <laughs> and we'd all get ready for Walt. As well as producing popular feature-length movies during the war, Disney also created award-winning propaganda films, one of which was Der Fuhrer Space. <coughs> These films helped put the company in better financial shape, especially after 1942's Bambi also didn't do well commercially, but have been taken to task for racial insensitivity. The 40s were a transitional period for the studio, diversifying into nature documentaries, package films, and hybrid movies of both animation and live action. Though these films were all important to fund the iconic films in the coming years, many have, like the propaganda pictures, not aged well. Case in point, Song of the South, released in 1946. Zippity doo zippity to this day, the film and the company have been criticized for its perpetuation of black stereotypes. The mid-20th century meant a return to animation with Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, and others, but also much more live-action forays such as Treasure Island. And this will be young master Arkins, I'll be bound. Arkins. Tis a proper seafaring name, too. What could be created in real life turned out to be Walt's next big passion project, the construction of a theme park. Walt's imagination had ventured beyond movies, though he did still produce feature-length movies like 1964's Mary Poppins. Opening in 1955, Disneyland had its growing pains and attractors, but quickly became a phenomenon, and a place where kids and adults could be young and young at heart, surrounded by top-notch theming. But it wasn't expansive enough, literally or figuratively. Walt looked to extend his little park that could, and soon enough, an area in Orlando, Florida seemed like just the place to make magic happen again. We have many things in mind that could make this unique and different than Disneyland. Will it be a Disneyland? Well, uh, I've always said there will never be another Disneyland, Governor. And uh, I think it's going to work out that way. Disney World was to be the site of Walt's pet project, Epcot, the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Much like Disney himself, this center would change with the times, always being on the cutting edge of innovation. It will be a community of tomorrow that will never be completed, but will always be introducing and testing and demonstrating new materials and new systems. Sadly, Walt wouldn't live to see Disney World or Epcot's opening. Keep it friendly, you know, make it a, a, a real uh, fun uh, place to be. I think they're convinced, and I think that'll hang on after, if, uh, as you say, after Disney. Walt had smoked for a long time, but hid it as it didn't fit the persona he wanted to externalize. Quote, I'm not Walt Disney. I do a lot of things Walt Disney would not do. Walt Disney does not smoke. I smoke. Walt Disney does not drink. I drink. And I said, for gosh sakes, Walt, why don't you give up smoking? And he says, well, guys... 
The guy's got to have a few vices, don't he? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. As someone whose face and name represented this idyllic escape from reality, it was all too sobering to lose such a visionary. Walt Disney died on November 30, 1966, at age 65 from complications from lung cancer. And everybody was just, you know, it's just like it taking the breath out of us. It was like the end of the world. Like many history-making entrepreneurs, Walt Disney had his flaws, but he also had drive, determination, and a yearning to make dreams come true. Few before or since have managed to innovate and rally talented minds quite so effectively to create worlds of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy. But I just want to say a word of thanks to all the artists, the workers, and everybody that helped make this dream come true. Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.